you know, the risk elements and uh, their uh, values, etc. As a result of this work, we uh, uh, basically took the 51 uh, protected areas that were already designated. Most of them, vast majority of them were designated by the Israelis. And uh, we uh, added uh, seven areas that are produced by the Marx and analyses. And, uh, and so we had 59 areas to evaluate. From those 59 areas, we came down to uh, 28 areas that ought to be protected. Uh, two of them new areas uh, and 26 from the old areas. We, so we eliminated a lot of areas that were apparently designated by the Israelis for political or other reasons, for um, uh, expansions of settlements or for military training zones, etc. Uh, the map on the left shows the previous and new protected area uh, network that we have designated. Black is the new lines, uh, red is the old protected area. And you can see areas eliminated here in red, uh, areas in which borders have been uh, changed, like the uh, canoe that uh, Elias is studying. Uh, the one on the right is... Uh, basically shows the, um, the improvement as a result of this work in terms of, uh, of areas like uh, plant cover, like richness of biodiversity, like wilderness or wildness uh, value, like existing designations such as uh, a key biodiversity area, important bird area or important plant area, etc. So we improved the designation of uh, protected areas in Palestine. And this uh, new map basically was approved by the Palestinian government at the highest level and all the ministers, and it was entered into the spatial map of Palestine. Uh, this is one of the newly designated protected area, uh, uh, South Jerusalem hills and valleys basically include uh, three valleys uh, Krimzan al Mahrur and uh, Hussein Valley, and uh, the communities around them like Batir al Walaj, uh, Hussein, etc. This area is a World Heritage Site also, and so it's a very important area to protect. Uh, unfortunately, the area is disconnected. As I said, there are four valleys. Uh, actually three that are part of the protected area. Wadi Fukin was not included in the protected area, and perhaps we should include it in the protected area. The three wadis are uh, along the green line that separates the West Bank from 1948 Palestine. And uh, and we just completed the study with uh, Johan from the museum on the uh, basically the disconnection between those three valleys and what exists in each of those valleys. We studied the plants and the butterflies as models to decide, um, uh, you know, the, the butterflies representing the fauna and the vascular plants for obvious reasons because they tell you about habitats and endangered species, etc. This was a study to understand habitat fragmentation because, as you can see, urbanization is budding in between those uh, uh, four valleys and also Israeli settlements uh, are part of this urbanization, settlements like uh, Gilo and Har Gilo, etc. So we were trying to understand habitat fragmentation and what we can do to conserve these uh, four areas, if you want, or at least the three protected areas in terms of the endangered uh, fauna and flora in them. It turns out that there is uh, good possibilities of protection within those areas, even if the connection between them is severed. The connection between them is actually a small uh, Ridge, a small valley that is the main valley that those four valleys actually connect to. So it's the one on the north here. Uh, 
and uh, it is right at the green line. So there are some political issues of conservation of this connecting route, because Israel actually wants to develop uh, further these colonial settlements, uh, both in West Jerusalem and inside the West Bank, where um, where the uh, settlements are being built in the South Jerusalem hillside. Uh, so now. Um, I put this uh, figure here to show you uh, Palestine looking and Jordan, obviously on the left, looking uh, from the north to the south, because we're always look, used to looking from uh, on maps by Eurocentric uh, idea of looking, uh, you know, the north is to the top and the south is to the bottom. Here the south is to the top. Um, the red line is the 400 millimeter ISO Hyatt. Uh, you can see the uh, spread of desertification on both sides of the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea. Uh, Lake Tiberias is closest to us, and then the Dead Sea, and then uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. And, uh, and desertification is spreading here, and we need to worry about this region here especially because Israel diverted the waters from the Jordan River. Uh, as you see, before uh, this diversion, the Jordan River was flowing at 1,350 million cubic meters per year. Now it's flowing at 20 million cubic meters per year, and it's basically a small stream. So one of our uh, designated uh, protected areas, the Dead Sea region, I'll talk about in a minute more about this, but uh, uh, but there is there's a lot of potential work there, research for you all to do, and I'm happy to collaborate on research on these areas of the Jordan River, on both sides of the river, etc. Uh, once we finished designating a protected area network, we started doing detailed research on these areas and publishing papers on them. For example, these are two nearby uh, areas, nearby to each other, I mean, uh, Mediterranean zone protected areas, Wadi Zarqal Ulwi and Wadi Kana. And these are habitats in Wadi Zarqal Ulwi and habitats in, uh, I'm sorry, this is Wadi Zarqa, this is Wadi Kana. And uh, the habitats are similar. Uh, when we looked at the vegetation, cover and the types of plants, we found some plants found um, unique in each of those habitats. This is another reason we have a lesson if you want to uh, learn that it's not enough to protect certain habitats like Mediterranean habitat or Iran Mediterranean habitat uh, within our regions. We really have to think of what exists and we have to have more detailed studies on this. We had hundreds of species of plants in each of those uh, uh, habitats, in each of these protected areas. But some plants were unique, some are rare and endangered, and found only in one of these protected areas. So it's important to protect both areas, if you want. Both areas also, interestingly, had vernal pools near them. Uh, vernal pools means that these are pools that get filled in the winter and uh, they dry up in the summer. And both vernal pools were unique, with unique habitats. For example, this is the one near Wadi Kana in the buffer zone of the protected area. And we found some unique plants and a unique toad not found anywhere else in the West Bank. Uh, this toad, by the way, Pilobatus syriacus, Elias also studied this with us. Uh, Pilobatus syriacus was found in Jordan and went extinct in Jordan. It's no longer found in Jordan. So this is the only habitat in the West Bank where this frog is found, where these plants are found, including this nice flower called ranunculus, uh, etc. Uh, so one message that I can say about uh, protected areas for you to kind of get down is that it's really important to study them very well, not, not just 
that they were designated. Um, sometimes you discover things you didn't know before. And this particular uh, protected area in which this pond was found, this uh, pool, uh, vernal pool, uh, this, uh, this was designated as a micro reserve. So designating micro reserves can also be a way of protection of very uh, leftover populations of things like these flowers and like this toad. Um, uh, this is one area, you know, so studying the protected areas, designating micro reserves, etc. Now, protection is not necessarily just in the protected areas. Uh, for example, the area I told you, Wadi Kremzan, uh, that's now part of the new newly designated protected area of South Jerusalem Hill, uh, has endangered species, but it also has a monastery, and the monastery owns a lot of the land. So we worked with the monastery to set up uh, projects of conservation in the monastery itself. The monastery is not included as, uh, you know, it is included in the sense that there's some protection. We don't want them to build a lot of buildings or sell their land or something. But we also want to work with the local community and the monastery. So we work with the monastery. We have uh, ch children education activities at the monastery regularly. Uh, the fourth point I want to make about protected areas that uh, we are engaged in is challenging. I told you we eliminated a lot of protected areas that were supposed to be uh, nature reserves uh, by Israeli designation, but are not really about nature protection. This is an area in South uh, Hebron Hills, Masafar Yatta. Part of it deserves to be protected indeed, but Israel designated it as a nature reserve, and on top of it, uh, nature reserve borders in green, and on top of the green there's the red which is the military training zone. So literally, the Israeli army is training in the middle of what's supposed to be a nature reserve and using tanks, etc. In the meantime, arresting children for picking wild uh, za'atar uh, oregano from the wild. Uh, these two children were arrested. You can see their house actually is uh, right there. They were picking around their house, but they said it's... Uh, it's forbidden. Israel also uses national parks, and they designate new national parks all the time to exclude Palestinians. So they use the political use of nature reserves uh, to exclude uh, the indigenous people uh, is an important uh, aspect. And we published one paper that relates to that. Uh, and, and another paper that relates to the use of national parks uh, for that. Uh, as you know, conflicts and wars also have an impact on our uh, environment. This is uh, Gaza destruction of universities, for example. <clears throat> you know, this is just some of the universities and assassinating uh, presidents and students. This is Al-Quds Open University. And I bring up Gaza because Gaza is very important. We did a small study remotely, actually. I had a colleague in Gaza help us with in Wadi Gaza because there was uh, an idea. This was four years ago, I think, an idea to stretch a, a gas pipeline through Wadi Gaza, which is one of the protected areas. This is Wadi Gaza uh, in Gaza that splits basically North Gaza from South areas of Gaza, and Israel forced the population, if you remember, in the first stage to move beyond Wadi Gaza. Wadi Gaza is heavily polluted now and still has some important wildlife, but it's really, really, now, of course, after this war, it's uh, 70, 80 percent damaged, and I wish to go there after this war ends to study it. Um, there is the conflict, uh, carbon emissions, and uh, etc. And this is from the Guardian, for example, that did some study on how many sorties that Israel has engaged in, 
how much pollution is produced from this. And it's very devastating to the environment, of course, to have these conflicts. In fact, uh, the Israeli-Gaza war over the first three and a half months um, uh, or, or less of this uh, Guardian study produced more gas than some countries like the Central African Republic. The damage and destruction, of course, include noise pollution, habitat destruction, soil erosion, water and wastewater issues. Uh, this is the pollution and water of Gaza before this conflict in terms of nitrates and chloride. Uh, from the um, Palestine Water Authority. And, uh, of course, now it will be all dark red because the pollution is very heavy. Um, I think, you know, another lesson to learn from our work uh, previously and now is that uh, the importance of field work cannot be overestimated. Um, and we have a herbarium, we have a museum, we have collections. The collections and taxonomic aspects are very, very important. Uh, I tell you, there are species that are endangered that are very similar to species that are not endangered, uh, phenologically, morphologically. And uh, without, uh, you know, DNA, without detailed analysis by taxonomists, you cannot tell this. And now we are using DNA, environmental DNA, by the way, and, uh, and uh, biological sample DNA for phylogenetic studies. For example, Emil here did her master thesis on orchid phylogeny and uh, understanding the orchids of Palestine in relation to other orchid species. Uh, one other area, our institute, the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability has a garden here, you can see it on the map, a botanic garden, a small area, we're talking less than 12 dunams in terms of the actual garden, but it has over 412 species, 60 of them are endangered species and rare species, including orchids and irises. This is what we call ex situ conservation, and I encourage you to also think about potential research in, in areas of not just in situ, how do we protect the micro reserve like the one in, uh, in Jin Safut near Wadi Kana uh, or in Kremzan area, but also how to think about protecting areas like this. And this is like a micro reserve also in the sense that we uh, plan things in. Now, <clears throat> there are lots of research projects that can be done, and I wish I had more time. I, we can talk as much as you want, of course, but, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of studies that can be done. Um, environmental DNA uh, is, a, is an area that's expanding in terms of conservation efforts. We have taken samples from water, for example, in the wetlands in Palestine, uh, like those wetlands in the Jordan Valley, like Ain Freshha and Basat al Malha. And we did the DNA analysis on them. From the water, you can just extract DNA and you can tell what animals lived in the water or even uh, walked through the water or drank from the water. Uh, so, we discovered many, many interesting findings. Uh, I won't mention them here because <laughs> we're working on this and there's another master's student working on it. Um, we took environmental DNA also from uh, various insects in Palestine and we are comparing, for example, uh, insects in protected areas uh, by using yellow traps, uh, from the protected areas in Palestine to see the diversity of uh, insects that get caught on yellow traps uh, in both the protected areas that have olive groves and protected areas that don't have olive groves and, and understand more about the uh, complexity of the, uh, of the species that are in those assemblages of species. 
Uh, other areas that need to be done more on is like vegetation maps and, and plant covers and things like that. And now with the new technologies, you can do a lot with remote sensing and GIS, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, what we talked about in situ and ex situ conservation, we talked about micro reserves, lots of potential for research in micro reserves. Uh, we need more in-depth studies of the protected areas. Uh, as I mentioned, we now are doing Malahan Dead Sea area. Uh, Dead Sea area is the largest uh, protected area in the West Bank. And uh, the uh, and I would like, if anybody in Jordan you can connect me with, so that we can collaborate on designating the whole area of the Dead Sea and the South Jordan Valley as an endangered ecosystem because it has very, very unique and uh, some endemic species, etc. Uh, the other areas of research that are available, if any of you want to collaborate, is on conflict, uh, wars, their impact on the environment, their impact on protected areas, protected area networks, and on our ability to protect these areas. When you destroy universities, like happening in Gaza, happened in Gaza. Uh, you know, eight universities were completely destroyed or damaged and run out of service, uh, universities and colleges. Uh, this, of course, detracts from the ability to do research, to do work. And we need to think about how we do this despite the difficult circumstances. We are doing some of this here in the West Bank. Um, and we must not forget that research and science, again, is meaningless if it does not translate to policies and to practice. Policies we did, for example, a National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan in Palestine, which we were the key people to put it together with the Environment Quality Authority, is the first NBSAP post-2020 goals of Kunming and uh, Montreal, as you know, the goals of the CBD. But, you know, putting all these strategies together and all these protected areas and all this research together is meaningless if you don't educate and you conserve on the ground. And we even have a mobile museum now that we take it to remote areas to educate them about conservation air, uh, efforts, including of course, most protected areas are in marginalized communities, so we focus on marginalized communities. Um, this is what our institute is being built now, uh, more and more. This is the new building. We have just introduced and publicized a new program in uh, technology with environmental sustain uh, sustainable environment, technology al al mustadama and, uh, and then we will introduce master and hopefully in collaboration with you, continue to work on PhD programs, et cetera. Our team and staff, uh, one of them is with you, I guess, and uh, maybe more, I don't know. But anyways, uh, are very hardworking and um, we appreciate uh, any potential collaboration networking for anybody who wants to work with us on these areas, protected areas, etc. Especially we need more collaboration with Jordan. We collaborate with Dr. Zahir Amr, published over 25 papers together, uh, but, uh, but uh, we need more collaborators in Jordan. This is our website and you can contact me here. Uh, I talked for exactly half an hour, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer, of course. Uh, can afford the time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Masin. Um, you. Ah, yeah, perfect. Now we can see you. Thank you very much for giving us this insight. Um, I would open the floor to questions if there are any, uh, Rasan. Um, can you tell me whether you understand the questions from the room? Otherwise, we'll sort something out. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a question. Uh, yeah, I think you maybe have to come up here to the microphone. You have to come closer to the. Uh, 
if it's working again. I can. Speak oh, yeah, it's working. Yeah. So I have a question about the methodology that you then uh, you mentioned the layers that you use. Uh, it was the main road, the minor road, and there was also built up areas and uh, negative uh, polygons. Uh, I was wondering what are the negative polygons? Are they, the, for example, the industrial? Uh, zones and how did you evaluate it? How did you give uh, the value, the negativeness of the value? Did you did the matrix? Uh, this is what uh, interesting for me. Um, for example, um, also you use like the negativeness it was pollution, noise or light or what negative means exactly. And one uh, question about the DNA costs. And if you use, uh, the, if you do have a data bank in Westpac or you send it to, to uh, outside the Palestine to analyze it. Thank you so much. Sorry, okay. DNA outside of what? Outside Palestine, they analyze it or in Palestine? Yeah. Do you have a data bank already? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll start with the second one. In terms of the uh, DNA, of course, there are DNA data banks like the national, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the American National uh, Genome Data Bank, there's the Genome uh, Data Bank itself, uh, and BCI. There's others uh, that are available now, European one, uh, that you compare and whatever sequence that people produced, whether in Europe or America, whatever they put in these databases, we'll put our sequences in the databases also. But we can compare our uh, sequences to other sequences and generate phylogenies that are much larger than what uh, Palestine has, uh, the, uh, uh, or what we have in Palestine. But the, uh, in terms of the Markson analyses, um, the IUCN and, uh, has actually uh, done a very good job on this. I'm not an expert in Markson or anything. In, uh, but it is available if you Google where, uh, you know, methods, you will find a lot of methods of how to do it in, in detailed description. Um, the uh, IUCN itself, actually, on their own website, they have a number of, uh, of uh, booklets about methodologies for evaluations of protected areas for giving, uh, for example, those... Um, categories of uh, protection like, uh, you know, strict reserve or not strict reserve, whatever. Uh, and they also have booklets on the threats and uh, that's how you evaluate threats. Uh, so do check those because there's also guidelines for threat analysis in protected areas that, that the IUCN publishes. Um, I think there are others that do this, but I think IUCN is the best in terms of their finding threats, etc., to to areas. Okay, now I think it's fine. <laughs> I'm going to go around with the microphone because I think that's much easier. I'm sorry, I can't hear anything. Is there? Oh. Yes, uh, you can hear me? Yes. My question is that, uh, as far as I know, uh, many of the protected area, the, the land is a, it's a private land, right? No, so some of us have reduced. Yeah, we, we reduced the amount of private lands by changing some of the protected area borders. We tried to keep it as state land or as uh, whatever. But yeah, there is a lot of private lands. But, but that doesn't mean you cannot protect them, of course. Even if it's a private land within a protected area, you can allow certain usage uh, and uh, discourage other usage or prevent other usage of it. Uh, 
Uh, hello, Doctor. Um, I have a question about the uh, percentage, maybe, if you have, of those protected areas in relevance to the uh, uh, unfortunate uh, divisions of uh, the West Bank uh, in terms of A, B, and C. Um, and how do you envision the protection of area C areas, uh, which are unfortunately under the control of the occupation? Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, actually, the whole West Bank is under the control of the occupation. I mean, they came into Bethlehem yesterday, uh, so they and they demolished houses inside Jenin refugee camp, which is in Area A. So the Israelis don't respect classifications of ABC, which were introduced supposedly as a temporary measure in Oslo between uh, 1993 or 1994 for five-year period. The five-year came and went, and here we are 31 years later, and we're still talking areas A, B, C. I think this is a ridiculous system that was created uh, supposedly temporarily until we get statehood for Palestinians, but Area C is being heavily developed by the Israelis. Area C is 60% of the West Bank, or a bit more. And in this area, Israel uh, does what it wants, much more than in areas A and B, because the areas A and B have a heavy Palestinian population. It is not that they respect those uh, areas or they protect them, even if I have protected area and area B, Israel can come in and build a settlement there. So they have been using the, uh, and indeed most of the uh, designated protected areas, whether by the Israelis or designated by us Palestinians, most of those areas fall in Area C by nature because they are the open areas that Israel uh, took uh, as a result of the Alon Plan 1968. So it was not even before the Oslo Accord, Israel prevented building in those areas or any kind of development in those areas by Palestinians while allowing development of those areas by Israelis. So the fact that they are in Area C uh, for me, as a Palestinian, as uh, somebody who's a strong anti-Zionist, if you want, uh, uh, Palestinian, does not mean that they have control over it. They, they claim they have control over it, but it's Palestinian land, and it's our land, and we should, we should protect it, we should uh, study it, we should uh, do everything in our power to make sure that uh, we set the stage for basically decolonization and removing those settlers and soldiers from our land. So I treat, for me personally, I treat a, a protected area in Area B in the exact same way as I treat a protected uh, area in Area C. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I also have uh, another... By the way, I'm Palestinian, so uh, <laughs> uh, this is Neda Najdalani from Ecopeace. Um, I always receive your uh, fantastic uh, briefs uh, on my email, uh, so thank you so much. I have another question regarding the... Um, uh, you mentioned that the protected, the updated protected areas were shared with the Ministerial Council and they've, uh, they've been approved by the government uh, recently. Um, can you maybe tell us more how um, this is infiltrating into the actual uh, um, planning at the ministries of uh, maybe, uh, 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 I don't know, um, uh, environment, the ministries of uh, um, uh, anyone that gives uh, maybe licenses for uh, construction, uh, for the municipalities, how are they actually utilized instrumentally uh, for uh, licensing and uh, approvals from the Palestinian system? Right. I'll quote for you what uh, Dr. Isa Musa al Baradeya, who is in charge of this project, from the Environment Quality Authority said to us and said in front of other people before that basically uh, this was the most 
important national project for Palestine done in the past 20, 30 years re regarding the environment, designating protected areas, because it freed up some lands for Palestinians to actually develop, despite Israeli objections, maybe, uh, which which are likely coming. Uh, it also uh, it also increased protected areas from nine percent to ten percent, and made sure that these are actually areas with endangered species, not like the previous nine percent, which over half of it was political uh, designations. Uh, so it's it's a very important project, and it was instituted. Now, how much a government implements it? Unfortunately, you know, as you know, we the government approved it, I think, in February or March 2023, um, and uh, and put in the spatial plan and uh, and everything else. So land uh, registration, all of this stuff, uh, began to be impacted in 2023. And then for the past five months, of course, we have a paralysis, if you want to call it that, of the Palestinian Authority not doing much regarding anything, let alone environmental issues, which are uh, very low, low priority for them. Um, that's sad because I could use this if they want to in uh, strong negotiation with the U.S., with the others, and uh, demand access. Now the West Bank is locked up. I mean, I went on three field trips in the past three weeks. Uh, I was endangering myself and the people with me by going on these field trips to these protected areas to collect. But I, as I said, I don't care. I think they don't uh, have a right to stop us. And if they stop us and they arrest us, say la vie, as they say in French, uh, or kill us for that matter. <laughs> uh, they have shot at people in the wrong areas at the wrong time. Uh, so we will proceed, and, uh, and but I think we need we need a lot more support from the government. We need a lot more uh, support from the international community uh, regarding these issues, and of course the other issues, as you know. Thank you. Another question. Thank you very much. Uh doctor for the uh, insightful presentation. Uh, actually, your last uh, point is very relevant to the question I had. Um, my background is policy, international trade policy, and I was interested to know if there were um, any policy initiative that were corresponding to the work you're doing. So, for example, um, the question about private property, uh, was there, were there any schemes or, or like policy tools introduced to prescribe um, the uses of such designated area for the private owner. Um, and I'm also interested to know other other laws or policies that were introduced and what are the tools or the mediators you have, either with the Palestinian uh, Authority uh, or the occupation. Yeah. I mean, yes, there is a body of international conventions and also international environmental law that uh, needs to be consulted on this matter. We are writing about this and publishing on this. Uh, in terms of international conventions, you have the Convention Biological Diversity. There's the IUCN, uh, which is not a, a, you know, a governmental or intergovernmental body although it has representatives from many governments. But uh, there's the uh, climate change conventions. There is the, uh, you know, the recent uh, Montreal Kunming uh, Convention that came out in December 2022, uh, two years late, actually, than it was supposed to, but that's because of the COVID-19. Anyway, these conventions all govern how we operate, and the same with the international environmental law. For example, Israel is doing a lot of activities that are violating even conventions that it signed itself, and they need to be challenged on this. And we have data on this, and if you would like, again, you know, if any of you want to collaborate on any particular subject, 
of your interest, I would be happy to collaborate with you and we publish papers together. For example, we could publish a paper together on Israeli violations of international environmental laws. Um, but in terms of private ownership of land and, uh, and so forth, uh, even though, again, it's not a UN body or anything, uh, IUCN has uh, very good uh, uh, booklets that describe what that means. For example, you can have a, a protected area that's mixed. That includes natural areas and privately owned land that is used for agriculture, for example. We did that with the Makhrur area, with the protected area in the South Jerusalem hills. These protected areas are mixed, basically, agricultural uses plus nature conservation. It is possible to do that. I get a certain category in the IUCN classification. I, I forget which one. But anyways, um, they, uh, uh, then there's procedures for how to do this. There's actually policies and procedures and action plans which are available for each category which you can, uh, which you can use. Uh, so check with the IUCN on this uh, material. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Otherwise, I would uh, let our people here in the room go to the coffee break. That is already said outside by some correctly. Thank you very, very much for your insight and your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you can email me at info at nature.org if anybody wants to connect with me. And you might want to stop the recording, and I'd appreciate if you send me the recording. Uh, yeah. Some of my staff are educating children now so that they cannot attend this, but I'd like them to see it. Yes, great. And I'm happy to give uh, to forward your email address to anyone who's interested who wants the email address. So please stop the recording now. Good luck. I wish the recording I could has stopped. With you. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you.